Okay, that was for me. That was good enough. But please put your hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The one who has made it possible for you and I to be gathered today. Celebrate Jesus like you mean it. Celebrate Jesus like you're excited to be in Metatethys 2024. Celebrate Him. Hallelujah. We give God all the praise, the glory, the honor, the adoration that He alone deserves. He's a faithful God. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Wow. When Father T mentioned this to me last year, I was like, oh, it's still far. But then look at where we are. <laughs> it came real quick. And so it's such a joy for me to be standing in front of you today. I don't take it for granted. It's a privilege. It's an honor. I mean, thank you, Jesus. If you're looking for a miracle, you don't need to look too far like Pastor Nathaniel says in his song to see how, God, how good God is just look at me. He's a good God. So I want to start this evening by saying thank you, Jesus. To you be all the glory, all the honor, and all the adoration. And I want to acknowledge every person seated here, everyone gathered today. Thank you for being here. Please celebrate yourself. For being here today, celebrate yourself. And to our online audience, I also want to celebrate you. A special mention, I see Sharon Omilaju, I see Damlola Balogun, I see Samuel, I see Wendy. We celebrate you. Thank you for joining us here today. And to all our pastors, we also celebrate you. Please celebrate your pastors. Thank you, Saz and Maz, for being here today. Our NYPM pastors, we celebrate you as well. We thank you for being here. Thank you to our zonal pastors, district pastor, area pastors. Thank you so much, sirs and ma'am. We don't take your presence for, here for granted. Thank you to my own pastor's wives leader. I appreciate you, ma. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. And of course, to Father T. We love you, Father T. We celebrate you, sir. Please celebrate Father T. You don't love Father T. Celebrate Father T. Thank you for all your sacrifice. Thank God for you, sir. And of course, to Big Mommy. Big Mommy is sitting here today. I mean, please celebrate Big Mommy for me. She's my Big Mommy. She's my mommy. She's my prophet. She's my pastor. Big Mommy, I love you so much. Thank you. I mean, you have prayed for me multiple times. So I already know that I'm moving in the power of your prayers. Thank you, Mommy. Thank you, Mommy. And of course, to Big Daddy. Big Daddy, I love you so dearly. I was telling him, I looked at my husband and I said, ah, that the last time Daddy was here for administration where I spoke was um, last year's um, teens conference. And Daddy hasn't been there like back to back. He's just always there. I really miss you, Daddy. Honestly, I miss you so much. I miss you so much. But I, I know that you'll be watching and I know that you will give me very needed feedback, and I'm looking forward to it. I honor you, Daddy. I love you so dearly. Mommy and Daddy, I am because you both are. I say that everywhere. I am because you both are. Thank you, Mommy and Daddy. Thank you so much. And to the person who has heard this sermon over and over, Reverend Kachi, salute. <laughs> salute Reverend Kachi for me, my one and only. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to go right into this word today. And the theme for this conference is kings and priests. Kings and priests. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, loving kindness, and tender mercies. This is the day that you have ordained to bless your people. No one who is here today watching online or being or physically present will leave the same way he or she is coming. Thank you because your word has transformative power and will transform the lives of every listener in the house today. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, because by this word we'll be internally impacted for your glory and our lives will never remain the same. No one will see and hear me. They will see and hear you. Father, take all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to begin with a brief story. 
and I'm going to tell it real quick because it happened last weekend. So last weekend, I think Friday, yeah, this past weekend on Friday, I had eaten quite a lot. And I, I mean, since I started my Fit Farm journey, I'm just very, I'm very careful. So I did eat quite a lot and then I was okay. Even by Saturday, I have a very small stomach so my food can last from Friday to Saturday. If I eat well on a particular day, I don't necessarily have to eat the next day. I've trained my body like that. Yes, so I've trained my body like that. Well, that's not the essence of the story. And so I had trained, on Saturday I was like, mm, I'm fine, I don't need to do anything else. I had really enjoyed my Friday. And I was just relaxing, I just made up my mind. But then here comes my husband. So I'm thinking there's this, you know, stewed beef I had hidden somewhere in the freezer and I'm thinking I tucked it away pretty good. And so he's, he's been going on all Saturday about how hungry he was and everything. I said, oh, you still eat. And then here he comes on Saturday. I'm relaxing. And then he's bringing a tray. I'm like, oh, you found food. Ah, awesome. Let me see. I look in the plate, it's my stewed beef. I said, why? I, I said, I don't understand. Do you not know that this is my meat? Like, I don't even joke. Like, ah, the, and I knew that he took every. I was like, this is the, all, all there's left. These are the three pieces. And you put everything in your plate. Please find something else to eat. And he was like, ah, no, no, I'm hungry. Like, I'm just going. I said, listen, this is my meat. You're not going to eat it. I mean, by that time, I was sitting up fully. No more relaxing, though, because ah, what is this? Out of everything else in the freezer, how did you find that one? And so, well, he wasn't going to get something else. I said, I have to join you. When I'm not hungry, I, will, I must eat my meat. And so we ate the meat together. We both shared it well. He even allowed me to enjoy it. So God bless you, Benkachi. <laughs> I enjoyed it with him. But I knew that I was full. I was like, ah. So by the time I, I had finished indulging myself, I started whining as I always would. Why did I eat it? Why didn't I just let him eat it? I started forcing, you shouldn't have eaten it. Ah, Uche, no, you should have just, because I was uncomfortable. I was full, so I didn't need to eat. I was forcing and forcing. And like me, this forcing continued to the next day. I was still forcing. Sunday morning, I'm getting ready for church. I said, who sent you? Why did you eat it? But you see, by Sunday morning, and even after I had eaten it, there was nothing that could happen. I couldn't go back in time to undo what had already been done. I'd already eaten the meat. It was a done deal. It was concluded. No matter how much I forced, no matter how much I complained, no matter how, matter how much I whined about the fact that you could have just let this thing go, you shouldn't have eaten it. I could not undo what I had already done. It was done. I couldn't go back in time to change it. It had already happened. I could not undo it. And so this leads me so why did I tell you this story? Am I trying to get you to be fit, fam, yeah? If the message is for you, well. <laughs> but that's not the essence of the story. It brings me to what I'll be speaking about today. The power of the past tense. The power of the past tense. And if you like, the power of what has already been done. No matter how much I forced, no matter how much I complained, it had already happened. The power of the past tense. Let's look at some examples from the scriptures of the highlights, the power in the past tense. Romans 5, 12. TPT, please move real quick. Romans 5, 12. TPT. When Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. When Adam sinned, not when you and I sinned, when Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. Sin entered the human experience and death was the result. And so death followed this sin, casting its shadow over all humanity because all have sinned. Sin was in the world before Moses gave the written law, but it was not charged against them where no law existed. Yet death reigned as king from Adam to Moses, even though they, had, they hadn't broken a command the way Adam had. The first man, Adam, was a picture of the Messiah who was to come. Adam was the one who sinned, yet everybody was found guilty. Adam was the one who did the wrong thing. The scriptures say it very clearly in verse 14. It was Adam that did it. He was the one that broke the law. Not everybody else. Adam did. 
And then yet, everyone was found guilty. The power of past tense. In Psalms, in 2 Samuel 7, rather, after David had successfully brought the ark of the Lord, so in chapter 6, he brought the ark of the Lord back to its rightful place and there was a big celebration. In 2 Samuel 7, David started to tell prophet Nathan about how he wanted to build the temple for the Lord and he really just, he was uncomfortable. He wanted to show God how much he loved him and wanted to build a house for God to honor him and show him how much he appreciated him. And Nathan said, oh, this is a fantastic idea. I think you should go ahead and do it. But then the scripture then goes on to say that God said to Nathan, it won't be David that will build me a house. I mean, I don't want him giving all his, you know, the things that have happened. I don't want him to build me a house, but his son will do it. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, NKJV, verse 16, NKJV, that his throne will be established forever. The Bible says, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your, your throne shall be established forever. The descendants of David, Rehoboam, and Abijah in 1 Kings 14, 21 and 1 Kings 15 respectively messed around. These were the descendants of David. They didn't follow the footpath of David. But because God had said in 2 Samuel 7 that David's throne will be established forever, even though his descendants didn't follow the right path, read it. In 1 Kings 14 and 1 Kings 15 about Rehoboam and Abijah, they still ascended the throne. They still ruled and reigned because of what had happened in 2 Samuel 17. Because of what had happened in 2 Samuel 17. These guys ruled. Despite their unruly behavior, despite breaking all the rules, these guys ruled ruled. They were not pursuing God like their grandfather was, but they still emerged as kings because God said to David, your throne will be established forever. Isaac trembling in Genesis 27 verse 33. Just Esau, he wanted to bless his sons and he said, Esau, go and get me, you know, go and get me game, go and hunt for me that I may bless you, that I might eat and my soul will be satisfied and bless you. That was the plan that Isaac had. But here comes Jacob, very cunningly, did it real quick in collusion with his mother and takes the blessing. Isaac, realizing what has happened, the scripture says, Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, who, where is the one who hunted the game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him and he shall be blessed. I cannot reverse what has already happened. Jacob did not get the blessing the right way, but the blessing could not be reversed. And I'm not advocating for being cunning or being underhanded, but what I'm establishing is that what had been done could not be reversed. What had happened could not be reversed. The power of the past tense. Balak says to Balaam, curse these people, curse them. Curse them, curse them. I want you to curse them. He takes, he, takes Bal he takes Balaam to different hilltops. I want you to curse these people. They're, they're, they're going, they're expanding on every side. And Balaam says to Balak, listen, I can't curse what God has already blessed. They're already blessed. They cannot be cursed. You not get it. The blessing is irrevocable, irreversible. They stand blessed. It cannot be reversed. Numbers 23, 20. So even if you take me to 10 hilltops, what has been done in the past, that blessing stands upon them and it cannot be reversed. The power of the past tense. Therefore, we read through the scriptures, even people that didn't obtain the things the right way, what happened? What happened with David was still speaking over his generation, even when they didn't do the right things. What happened with Jacob was still speaking, even when he didn't get it the right way. The blessing was still speaking. Therefore, for us as believers, the power of the past tense lies in what Jesus Christ did in his death, burial, and resurrection. 
That's the power. That's where our power lies. What he did. And it cannot be undone by any satanic force or manipulation. Let every part of hell gather. It cannot undo the sacrifice of Jesus at his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 5, 15. TPT. Now there is no comparison between Adam's transgression and the gracious gift that we experience. For the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. It's true that many died because of one man's transgression, but how much greater will God's grace and his gracious gift of acceptance overflow to many because of what one man, Jesus the Messiah, did for us? Verse 16. And this free-flowing gift impacts to us much more. What he did is much more. It impacts to us much more than what was given to us through the one who sinned. For because of one transgression, we were all facing a death sentence with a verdict of guilty. But this gracious gift leaves us free from our many failures and brings us into the perfect righteousness of God, acquitted with the words, not guilty. Verse 17, death once held us in its grip and by the blunder of one man, death reigned as king over humanity. But now, how much more are we held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings in life, enjoying our regal freedom through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus, the Messiah? What Jesus did for us is much more than anything the enemy can ever, ever bring against us. That's why daddy will always say that what God is doing in our lives, what God has done in our lives is more powerful than anything the enemy could ever bring against us. When we talk about the power of the past tense and the natural, we see people who have, I mean, we've all had, heard, I mean, of experience, even if we've never witnessed, we've heard, all heard of experiences in the natural. So this is the power of the past tense without Christ right? If somebody went through a traumatic situation in their childhood, how many of you know that it has the potential to derail the person's future if not properly handled, if not properly taken care of? Things that happened to us in our past, if we don't renew our minds to who God says we are, has the potential to completely just take you off course because you never really know what people experience. I remember Big Mommy came back, they were saying she had a busy, busy schedule. IWPC just came back from a Saba and somebody was giving a testimony. God delivered this lady miraculously from an accident. I mean, this, she, was, she was meant to die. They can't, I mean, the, the, the bullet that they sprayed on her, so she was shot severally, I'm thinking about 20 times. So this is the lady that should have died. And she was even pregnant when she was shot. But God saved her, saved the child. But as an aftermath, unfortunately, she's scared of elevators. She's scared of being in closed places. So she can't be in the elevator. So even if a place is like 20 floors, she's going to climb the stairs. Because of what has happened to her, because of what she went through, the power of the past tense. She could, when she went to visit Big Mommy, she was saying, even to fly, so let me even explain this, even to fly in an aircraft, she couldn't be in enclosed spaces. She didn't like it. So she goes to visit Big Mommy, and I think Big Mommy is on the ninth floor or something, either. She's on the fifth floor, thank you, Mommy. She was on the fifth floor, she climbed the stairs, and she went and told Big Mommy, and she was really grateful for, you know, fellowship and relationship and she's about to go downstairs and our big mommy says you will use the elevator she's like eh elevator she's like yes you will use the lift to go downstairs she's like big mommy do you know what you're talking about big mommy says yes oh yeah she calls her her um, protocol go downstairs with her in the elevator and so the lady gets into the elevator and she holds on to big mommy's protocol so dearly because she's so scared and then before you know what's happening the lady's like oh we're downstairs she's like really really we're downstairs already please celebrate big mommy but because of what she had experienced the power in the past tense in the natural was affecting her life the power of the past tense. Romans 5.12, where we read, talks about the fact that death was, the, was what was for everybody. 
death was the resulting effect of what Adam did. So everybody was faced with death. It says the entire world was affected. Even though you and I were not the ones who ate the um, fruit in the Garden of Eden, we were all affected by it. We were all affected by the actions of Adam and what he did in the Garden of Eden, even though we were not there. But thank God that Jesus came and redeemed us and redeemed us and brought us back and set us free from the power of death, set us free from the power of, power of sin, set us free from the power of hell. Thank God for Jesus. Because of Jesus, what is now in our past account is the blessing. Ephesians 1, 3. And he has blessed them with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So what is in that account when you look at your past is not your past mistakes, is not your failures. It's the blessing because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, not one blessing, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And we can read it and it can be a bit abstract because I was saying to God one time, I said, what are these blessings? You know, I mean, I want to be able to understand it for myself. And he said, think about it. Blessings, what blessings do you pray for in the heavenly, in the heavenly realm? You are praying for favor. You are praying for increase. You are praying for wisdom. You are praying for multiplication. You are praying for prosperity. You are praying for joy. These and many more at the things that you already have. You are already blessed. So it is your responsibility to go and draw from what has already been bestowed on you. The blessing is a done deal. It's not something that's going to be done. You are not going to be blessed tomorrow. You are already blessed right now. Right now. You are already blessed. And if you, if you doubt that what these blessings are saying, go to Revelation 5.12. I saw this the other day and I said, ah, Holy Spirit, you are actually, you, you knew exactly what you were saying. Revelation 5.12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. These are the things that accrue to you and I. These are the things that has already been done. And it cannot be reversed. This blessing is a done deal. Waiting for you to take hold of it, to lay hold of it, to lay hold of what has already been done. First Corinthians 1.30 says, for your benefit, for your benefit, if you read it in NLT, for your benefit, God made him wisdom. For your benefit and for my benefit, it's already a done deal. This is why daddy will say we need to get angry. Because when you really think about it, if the power of the past tense in the negative has the, has, can affect you so adversely, how much more what God has done for you already, what is already concluded, daddy will say we need to get angry, we're too, we're too docile, we're just relaxing. When you know what has already been done, it changes the game. The power of the past tense. This is why the scripture says that you have already been blessed. You are already blessed. The blessing went ahead of the sickness. It went ahead of the disease. It went ahead of the pain. Isaac, the blessing went ahead of the famine. And so whether there is famine or not, that blessing has gone ahead of you and it must speak. You will sow in a time of famine and you will reap a hundredfold return because what you are functioning in, what is in your account is the blessing. The blessing went ahead of you, Joseph. It went ahead of you into Potiphar's house. It went ahead of you. And so you are going to Potiphar's house and you are going to be prominent. You are going to take over because the blessing is upon your life. Whether you are in Potiphar's house as a slave or you are thrown into the prison and, and, and you don't even know where to turn, the blessing will locate you. The blessing has already gone ahead of you into that prison. It cannot be stopped. It cannot be undone. It will work even in the prison. The blessing has already gone ahead. The blessing is already done. David, you have been anointed king. 
It doesn't matter who is coming after you. You are already anointed. It doesn't matter what Saul is trying to do. He can come after your life multiple times. But you are already anointed king and you will ascend your throne. Because that anointing has gone ahead of you. Ahead of whatever it is the enemy will try to bring against you. It went ahead. The anointing was already done. It can't be reversed. Mephibosheth, you were dropped as a child. Completely forgotten at Lodabar. Nobody thought about you. But you see, what you don't know is that David and Jonathan caught a covenant. And because of what has already happened, even though man and everybody has forgotten you and abandoned you in Lodabar, what you see is that what happened before is still chasing after you. It's still speaking for you. That covenant that they caught together, you may have been forgotten and completely abandoned at Lodabar, but that covenant went ahead of the fact that you will be dropped and abandoned and that covenant says even if you are in Lodaba, you are coming out to sit on your table the power in the past tense this is why daddy will always say I, 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 when I was preparing my, my notes were filled with big daddy big daddy I said well he's my prophet he's my pastor everything we hear even this sermon she said it's big daddy because I was listening to his message and then boom he hit me the power of the past tense big daddy will always say you cannot undo in time what God has perfected in eternity. Now you have a better understanding. When something has already been done, completely complete, perfectly perfect, time cannot undo what has already been done. If these people who were not on the right path, they were not on the right path. I said it about David's uh, descendants. They did the wrong thing. And yet, yet what had been done what god said to david stood how much more we who are standing on what jesus did for us it cannot be undone and you know what thank god these blessings are not in the future thank god they are already a done deal because a lot of times when we see you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings we might not feel blessed, we might not see blessed, and so we think, oh, God is going to bless me. He's not going to bless you, he has already blessed you. Everything he needed to do, he has already done. It's a concluded matter. It's not a futuristic thing. Because if it was in the future, several factors come into play. If I tell somebody today that I'm gonna give you my phone, for instance, or I'm gonna give you a sum of money, I'm gonna bless you, I want to bless you, with, a, with a, an amount of money, a substantial amount of money. How many of you know that if I later discover that the person I want to bless has a bad attitude, she's not very nice, even though I told her that I want to bless her, I will think about it again. I'll be very hesitant. If I see that her behavior is, <laughs> is, is giving what I don't know, I will want to hold back my my blessings I would want to hold it back yes my integrity is on the line and I understand but let me tell you something I would want to hold back I, it won't be the same even if I eventually give her it won't be with joy it would be just take I already said it because the factors come into play there are no guarantees even though God is not man but this is just to paint a picture of the things that could happen. I was reading through the devotional today and I said to myself, ah, this devotional is really in line with what I'm trying to speak because I believe that what God wants me to do here today is to establish what has already been done, to tell you kings and priests is a concluded matter. It's not something that you are going to be. You are not going to be made kings and priests. You don't start praying, God, make me a king and a priest. It is already a done deal and I'm going ahead of myself. But that is what I believe God wants me to establish here today. And so in the devotional today, Isaiah 54, verse 7 to 8, just to buttress this point, please give it to me, NLT. For a brief moment, this is God speaking, I abandoned you, but with great compassion, I will take you back. In a burst of anger, I turned my face away for a little while. Wow. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Redeemer. 
And so God wanted to bless his children. His disposition has always been to bless. His disposition has always been to pour his love out. His disposition has always been, I will bless you abundantly. I mean, Deuteronomy 28. If you will obey me and you, I will bless you. Incredible blessings which you cannot even count or imagine. That has always been his disposition. But then the factors come. The factors come into play. So I want to bless you, but your behavior is eh, it's not necessarily in alignment. And that's what that scripture, in a burst of anger, I turned my face for a little while. So maybe you were doing something that you shouldn't have been doing. And because, because God's eyes cannot behold iniquity, he has to turn away from you. In that regard, in the Old Testament now, that doesn't mean that's not what happens now. But unfortunately, in the moment where it was a case of what had not happened in Jesus, God had to turn away. And so the enemy swoops in and shows people water. Because it's not God that gives people water, water, it's the devil. God does not do water, water. God is good and does only good. But then when he turns his back, the devil is not going to take any chances. He's going to fire his best shot. Jesus, and then God said, listen, this is back and forth. I don't want it anymore. I want it to be so established. I want everything. I don't want any factors to come into place, to come into play. I want it to be a completely done deal that their misbehaviors cannot change and undo what I've already done. I'm not looking at them. I'm looking at Jesus. I will put and establish these blessings in Jesus. So no matter what happens, come rain, come sunshine, you are blessed. No matter what happens, because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, you stand blessed. Your standing does not change even when your behavior does. He had to put it in Jesus. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. And because of Jesus, his back is never turned on you. Because of Jesus, he will never leave you nor forsake you. So you don't have to be worried about that. I'm just using it to buttress the path of if it was in the future. <sighs> Too many factors. But thank God that we are already blessed. Thank God that he already concluded everything. Thank God that it is not in the future. God said, let me get it out of the way. So there were no factors, no conditions hindering me from being a blessing to my people. It was already done. This is why Big Daddy keeps on telling us, God is not going to do anything new. There's nothing new that God is going to do. He has done everything that he needed to do. When he cried out with a loud voice and said, it is finished, he meant everything Everything has been concluded. Nothing left out, nothing missing, nothing broken. Every single thing is already done. That's why 2 Corinthians 1.20 says the promises of God in Christ are yea and amen. It is already done and it is now our move to stand in the brutality of what Christ has already done. And enforce the defeat of the enemy. This is why daddy will say the promises of God, they are not an indication of what God is going to do. It's what is already done. You can lay hold of the promise. It's already completed. It's already completed in Christ. You can lay hold of your healing. You can lay hold of your prosperity. You can lay hold of your wisdom. Whatever you need, it's already done. It's not going to be done. It is already done. And so you are guaranteed. When something is done, there is a guarantee. If I tell somebody here today, I give you the receipt. I tell you to go to the car dealership and pick up a car. It's paid for, I give you the receipt. I tell you, here it is. I paid for it, go and pick it up at the dealership. How many of you know that if you get to the dealership and the attendant is saying something, you're just gonna be like, what are you saying? I have my receipt here, I have my proof. My car is already paid for. I am not living here, if you like. Call police, call DSS, call CIA, call FBI, call everybody. It is already done. You will be so assured. You will sit down there like somebody who owns a Tesla. You will not leave. No matter what happens, 
Listen, I have the receipts, I have the documents to show that it is already a done deal. You will insist on what belongs to you. But when you are waiting for it to be done, if I tell you, go to a car dealership, I'm going to pay. And they tell you, ah, if they just give you a look from the door, you're already going to be timid. You're already going to be shaking. Maybe she didn't pay for it. She might have had every intention to pay for the vehicle, but maybe she didn't pay for it. Maybe there were factors that affected the payment. That confidence will not be there. You will be shaking, and there is every possibility that you will live without that Tesla that day. You will probably just be like, well, maybe she didn't pay for it. But when you know, when you know that here is the receipt, here is the evidence, it is already a done deal. You are not moving anywhere. You are standing unshakable, unmovable in what the evidence. You don't have the cow. What you have is the paper. What you have is the document that shows this has already been completed. You don't have the car yet but you have the evidence how many of you know that our evidence that it is done is in the bible it's the word of god we have the evidence and so we can stand and insist on our healing on our breakthrough on our on our prosperity on our academic success we can stand and insist on what god already did for us it's already done It's already done. That's the power of the past tense. It's already done. But you know what it is? We fail to walk in this truth because of ignorance. Because of ignorance, we probably just don't know. And that's why Big Daddy will keep emphasizing, you must know, you must know what has been done for you. You must know, that is the only way you can stand. They that know their God shall be strong. You will know and then you will stand and then do exploits. You cannot do exploits without the knowledge. You will know, you will stand in what has been done and then you will do exploits. Knowledge is what breath exploit knowledge is what breath exploits you cannot do if you don't know you must know and you must know correctly because wrong revelation will put you in bondage wrong revelation will put you in bondage it is done but you need to do a b c d wrong revelation will put you in bondage that's why you must be careful i'm very careful my husband said something to me a few years ago and he hit me he said you are like a sponge and it's true i soak up things i soak up information i soak up information and he said you are a sponge you must be very careful what you listen to so you don't soak up the wrong thing find out what christ has done and insist on it no matter what the enemy says to you you know Christ has already done it find out what Christ has done and insist on it Jeremiah I have made you I appointed you I ordained you a prophet it is already done I already did it you are already ordained and a pro a pro a, 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 you already ordained and appointed a prophet it doesn't matter what it is what it looks like in the natural I don't care that you are shy you are timid you are young I ordained you a prophet it is already a done deal and you must manifest everything that I've said concerning you Gideon you might be freshy wheat in the wine press but I'm telling you that you are a mighty man of valor that is who I made you it is already completed it is already done it doesn't matter what you are currently doing what you are currently doing your behavior does not change your standing it does not change what I did already in the past it is already done If you choose not to walk in the reality of it, it won't be God's fault. God is saying, my path is a concluded matter. And he's saying it to me too. For a long time, I was very shy, or I thought I was shy. And people corroborated the story that I was shy. So I refused to step out. I would just sit down there very timidly because, ah, Uche, you are shy. But then Uche, I've ordained you a mighty woman of valor. It cannot be undone. It cannot be reversed. If you refuse to step out of it, step out on what I've ordained you to be, it won't be because, it won't be because I didn't do it. It won't be because I didn't ordain you. It will be because you chose not to. My own part is already completed. It was completed before you were formed in your mother's womb. It's already done. 
But if you say no, I will also say amen. That's it. It's going to be you. It's already done. His love is already done. I have loved you with an everlasting. I have, in fact, I have loved you. I'm not going to love you. I have loved you already. In spite of your mess, I have already loved you. I, that scripture blew my mind while I was studying. I have loved you before your errors, before your mistakes, before your mess. I have already loved you with an everlasting love and my love cannot be undone. It cannot be reversed. God, I don't feel loved. I am greater than your feelings. First John 3, 20. Never forget this in NLT. God is greater than your feelings. I don't feel this way. I feel this way. God is greater than your feelings. I don't feel up to it. I don't feel enough. God is greater than your feelings and he knows everything. It is done. This is why daddy says we fight from a standpoint of victory. We fight knowing what has already been done. We fight with an understanding of what God has already done on our behalf. We don't fight looking for him to do. We fight knowing that the victory is already ours. That's how we fight. We fight by standing brutally, vehemently in what Jesus says is ours. So he says healing is yours. Isaiah 53, I went to the cross for your healing. I stand in that. God, you said I am healed. I am healed from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet to the tips of my finger. Every part of my body is functioning perfectly to which you, you are, to that which you already created me to be. It is already done. I am already healed. You stand when he says it's your wisdom. You have been made wisdom for me. I cannot be confused. I cannot be confused. Christ was made wisdom. Christ cannot fail. I cannot be confused. You stand brutally. That's the fight we are called to. And that's the power of the past tense. Our theme, kings and priests, called out our Revelations 9, 5. Revelations 5 from verse 9. Please give it to me in TPT. And they were all singing this new song of praise to the Lamb. Because you were slaughtered for us, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Your blood, listen, listen to what the price was. Your blood was the price paid to redeem us. You purchased us to bring us to God out of every tribe, language, people, group, and nation. His blood was the price. You have chosen us to serve our God and formed us into a kingdom of priests to reign on the earth. Give me verse 10 in, 10 in NKJV, please. And has made us, we're already made, we're already made kings and priests and has made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Revelations 1 verse 5 to 6 also establishes this truth. So does 1 Peter 2, 9, establishing the same things, telling us that kings and priests, as it concerns kings and priests, as it concerns kingship and priesthood, it's already done, it cannot be reversed, it cannot be undone, it is already a done deal. And so who is a king? A supreme ruler. One who rules over a kingdom, domain, or territory. A supreme authority over a nation. I mean, we all see kings. We all, if you don't even know any other king, you know the king of England and queen of England. So you can draw inferences from them. A monarch. Kings have authority. Kings have dominion. Kings have power. The scripture says, where the word of the king is, there is power. Kings have power. That's why somebody can wake up and say, subsidy is. Uh -huh. They have power. Kings issue decrees and they stand. Kings issue decrees and the decrees stand. Irrespective of what the decree is. You know, I was 
studying and this really hit me so strongly. Esther was afraid to go to the king in her time. She couldn't approach her husband, the king, because an, a decree had been issued. For you to know how resolute, how definite a decree of the king is, Esther, the queen, could not approach the king because of a decree that had been issued. Kings issue decrees and they stand, no matter how crazy the decree is. The scriptures, Bible, uh, the scriptures say in Daniel 5 from verse 8 that the king Darius issued a decree. They had coerced him and told him to issue a decree that anybody who prays will be thrown into a den and, you know, things will happen in a den of lions. They had coerced Darius to issue a decree and I hope I'm getting it right. I'm thinking Daniel 5, yeah? No, Daniel 6, I'm sorry. Daniel 6, thank you. Just Daniel 6, yes. So they had told him to issue a decree in Daniel 6 that anybody that prays, um, you know, to another God except their God will be thrown into a den of lions. And this was a trap because the king actually loved Daniel. That's why it's actually dangerous to be a king without the priesthood. It's the priesthood that makes you very discerning. So when they're setting a trap for you, the priesthood will tell you that this is a trap. Jump over it. It's that priesthood in you that tells you that this decree is wrong. But he was just a king. And he took the decree to say anybody that um, worships another God will be thrown in the den of lions and stood by it. It couldn't be undone. It couldn't be changed. That's how powerful the decree of a king is. And God said to me while studying that, he said, Uche, you are a king, but you make decrees and then you begin to vacillate. Instead of standing brutally in the decree and saying, I have made this decree, it must happen even though I have, as, I said, as I've said it, because your decrees are backed by the word of God. But when you don't see it, you begin to vacillate, becoming unstable. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and let him not expect that he will get anything from the Lord and you wonder why things are not happening when kings issue decrees how much more kings priests they stand brutally in that decree if people could be issuing silly decrees in the scriptures and stand by it as a king priest you better open your mouth and decree what God says and stand brutally in it refusing to shift ground based on what you can see, knowing that what you have said, what the scripture says is yours. Kings issue decrees and stand by it. We can go on and on about who a king is, but let's move on to a priest. A priest is one who ministers to God, a mediator between God and the people. Hebrews 5 verse 1 establishes this. They would offer sacrifices, before God on behalf of the people. And I love this. A priest is one who has dual responsibility. They represent God before the people and then come out. So they go into the back in the day, they will go into the Holy of Holies, represent God before the people, but come out and represent, um, represent, sorry, represent the people before God. Sorry, the other way. They represent the people before God, offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. You know, they're a mediator between God and the people, they will represent the people before God. God, this person is presenting this to you. But then they come out and represent God before the people. Do our responsibility. And so from this, we see that priesthood deals with our relationship with God and kingship deals with our dominion here on earth. That's why when 2 Peter 1, 3 says, I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness, it's not a play on words. I have given you what it takes to rule and dominate in this life. And I've also given you what it takes to have a relationship with God. Every single thing that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. He made us kings and priests. Vertical king, priests, horizontal kings. Everything taken care of. Everything taken care of in the cross. Vertical, horizontal 
kings and priests. We have direct access to the Father. We can go before him boldly. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 states this. And we have dominion to reign here on earth. Romans 5, 17. Everything that God did is what is needed for here. It is here you exercise dominion. You're not going to heaven to exercise dominion. Are you dominating God? It is here that dominion is needed. It is here that we dominate. It is here that our kingship is... He says he's king of kings. So, I mean, when you get to heaven, are you going to be king over God? It is here that we must exercise the dominion mandate. Reigning in life is for here. It is for here. Everything he did, he did so that we will reign in life. Like Big Daddy will say, we are not victims, we are victors. We are not victims, we are victors. But we must know this. We must know this. And so let's look at the scriptures very briefly to see the practical demonstration of what it means to be a king and a priest. And you know, God is so perfect. God knows the perfect combination required to succeed here on earth. He said kingdom priest. He didn't say one or the other. It's a perfect combination because he knows that it, that combination it is, is what is required for when they come to you to say, this woman was caught in adultery, Jesus. The law says she should, be, she should be stoned to death by reason of what she did. And then you get down and take your time and you start writing on the sand. And by the time you rise up, you say, he without his sin cast the first stone having a perfect response to the challenges of life that come against you because you are a king and a priest if you check through scriptures there were kings that made the, they didn't have any priesthood and they made the worst of decisions there were kings that offered to kill babies exodus 1 and matthew 2 they killed babies because no priesthood no priesthood but a king and a priest, and we see one of such in Daniel. If you read through the book of Daniel, Daniel was a king and a priest. He reigned here on earth, and he did not mess around with his relationship with God because he understood that his priesthood emanated from, sorry, his kingship emanated from his priesthood. He knew that who he was, his reigning emanated from, from his relationship with God. And that's why when he was faced with death, they said, Daniel, don't pray to God anymore. Daniel said, you don't know who you are talking to. Even if I perish, I will perish. Do you think I'm coming up with all these ideas and all this wisdom from just random things? It is my priesthood that ensures that I dominate the right way. And God's kingdom is established here on earth because that's the whole purpose to establish God's kingdom here on earth. If you, that was a fantastic thing and I want you to read through it. But beloved, the world we live in today is waiting for the manifestation of kings and priests. The kings, the experts don't have the answer anymore. Like daddy will say, the center is not holding. They don't have the answer. They're waiting for people who know their identity in God to rise up. To rise up. They're waiting for you and I. People have got the power in the past tense. For us as believers, it lies in no other place than in what Christ accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. He did it all. He made us kings and priests. Therefore, if you fail to reign, it won't be because he didn't perfect everything that concerns you, but it will be because you failed, you and I failed to take our place and leave out our God-given reality. Let's rise to our feet. And we're going to just pray one simple prayer. But before we just pray, we'll probably sing it one time as a sign of commitment to God. We will never settle for less. We know there's more that's found in you. Oh.
it and say, I will never, I will never. as a king and priest I refuse to settle for less than who you have made me that's it Lord I take my place I know what you have already done I refuse to settle for less than what you have made me I take my place your price on the cross of Calvary your death burial and resurrection will not be in vain. I take my place. I take my place today in the name of Jesus. I refuse to just pass through this earth without making an impact. I take my place today. I refuse to settle for less. I refuse to settle for less. You've made me. Your part is already done. I take my place. I walk in the reality of what you have already perfected concerning me in the name of Jesus. Lord, we take our place today. <laughs> like Esther, we say if we perish, we perish. We take our place in the reality of who you have made us and we stand brutally and vehemently in it the world will know that metathesis 2024 the attendant participants have a reason to who god has made them to be that kings and priests have a reason in this land in the name of jesus blessed be your name lord in jesus name we pray Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. Kings, kings have a way of giving to God. They don't seek God. They give. They give joyfully. They don't seek. When you understand what he has done, when you understand the price that has been paid on your behalf, you are giving joyfully, you are giving with, I mean, with all the joy in your heart, saying, thank you, Jesus, for making me a king and a priest. It's not because I qualified, I didn't do anything. Thank you, Lord, because you have made me. You have given me what it takes to reign in this life. And so you give God cheerfully. You give him cheerfully, knowing that he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You give him as a king and a priest with understanding today. And if you have put aside your offering, the account details are on the screen for all of us who do transfers. All of us who do transfers, please transfer your offering to the account details on the screen. And if you have done that, you can rise up. You can rise up and let's say a prayer for our offering. Father, we just want to appreciate you for your faithfulness, your loving kindness and tender mercies. Thank you for making us kings and priests through your precious blood of the Lamb, O oh God. We are so grateful. Thank you for giving us everything that pertains to life and godliness so that we can reign in this life. We love you, Lord. And we just give this to, in appreciation to say thank you. Recognizing our identity in you. We exalt you, Lord. We love you with the de from the very depths of our hearts. Thank you for Met Metathesis 2024. It goes from glory to glory. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Celebrate your offering. Hallelujah. Let that test you 2024. Can we rejoice? You guys don't sound excited. No? I said, can we rejoice? All right, praise the Lord. So quickly, quickly, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. 
So quickly, I want to teach us our theme song for Metathesis. We have a theme song this year. Are we excited? Yes, we are. Are we excited? Yes, we do. Yeah. So now, I'll sing a line and you repeat after me. Is that good? So the first line is, I serve a God who reigns supreme. Everybody go. Who reigns supreme. The next line, listen. He is a God of everything. Everybody say. Of everything. Yeah, yeah, good audience. Third one. He left heaven to dwell in me. Everybody sing. He left heaven to dwell. And the last line. Now he's anointing. He's the spirit in me. Say now he's anointing. Now he's So let's run it together. Say, I serve a God who reigns supreme. He is the God of everything. And he left heaven to dwell in me. Now he's anointing. Now are we ready to sing it together? Now, now, please, you must rejoice. Are we ready? Are we ready? Be ex I want to see you jump. Be excited. Are you ready? Say, I serve a God. I serve a God. Who reigns supreme. Who reigns supreme. He is the God. He is the God. Amen. Come on. 